Welcome to the Stoa. The Stoa is a digital campfire where we cohere and dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of what's happening now. Okay, check-ins. Um, a little tired. I was hoping to get a coffee before this. Uh, and there's a, a countervailing pressure to be sharp right now because my friend BJ Campbell is no slouch um, in the intellectual department. So welcome to the STOA. I am Peter Lindbergh, a steward of the STOA, and the STOA is a place for us to go here and dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of this moment. And today we have my buddy BJ Campbell. Um, for those of you who don't know BJ, uh, he came on my radar like almost two years ago now. He wrote this excellent uh, piece about social justice being a crowdsourced religion. And he, and he writes about, at least at the time he came on my radar, write about guns and then sort of culture war issues. And then we had a, a few chats jamming about uh, the culture war from our different perspectives and, and we, we, we hit it off. And so you know, I'm happy to have BJ back um, or not or back in conversation with me, but the first time here at the STOA. And so BJ, uh, he's a big fan of Eric Hoffer, and he, he wrote an article um, called The True Believer, uh, speaking about how Eric Hoffer's ideas relate to what is happening today and, and are quite relevant. So what we're going to do today, we're, it's like a typical, you know, kind of Q&A, uh, but this time BJ is going to read a quote, and then me and him are going to jam on it. And if you have any questions that you would like to ask BJ or just contribute to the conversation, right in the chat box, you know, the moment we start talking and then we can kind of conclude you in this. And uh, we're officially here for an hour, but we might stay a little longer, we'll, we'll, we'll announce that. So that being said, BJ, do you wanna have any opening remarks? Introduce yourself, say hi. Oh, you're on, I put you on mute. Uh, I asked you to unmute yourself, let's see. Yeah, there you go. Hey, Zoom. <laughs> so, yeah, so the, I don't know, the synthesis for this article that I put together recently um, was really it was that I went to the beach and I went to the beach the week of the riots and I'd planned on bringing, you know, True Believer there anyway to reread it because I hadn't read it since high school and everything just seemed screamingly obvious that this is kind of predictive to what was going on in 2020. The thing was written in 1951. It's a really old book. I mean, by our standards. And it was written in a context of, you know, just post-World War II and everybody's kind of like, you know, washing the blood off the coffins and trying to figure out what the hell was going on. Like, how did that happen? And, you know, where did fascism and communism and Nazism, how did these things erupt? And Hoffer was one of the ones that distilled it in the, the sense of it, the overall sense of the book, if you haven't read it, is that... Um, these movements are not ideological and they're not rational. They're based on group psychology. And they are something that um, happens to groups of people and under certain circumstances and they will just emerge. And if you have the right circumstances, one or more of them is going to emerge. And sometimes I might fight and sometimes it might get ugly. And sometimes it's not so bad. It's not that he characterizes all mass movements as bad, um, but like he would, you know, multiple times in the book, he characterizes the, um, the colonization of the United States from England as a mass movement that's not bad. I mean, from, you know, the Anglo-American perspective anyway. And, um, you know, so I just kind of started, you know, moving through this and, you know, everything coalesced in my brain. When I put the article together, I was only able to get about half of my notes into the article because the article was already so got awfully long. Uh, what I did is I went ahead and carved off the rest of my notes and I've got them all up here. And I figured we just like banter about pieces and kind of take a look at what's going on. And um, so I'll read, I'll read a quote. You tell me your opinions of it because it sounds like, sounds like stuff that's going on right now to me. Let me, um, here we go for part one. Um, it is a truism that many who join a rising revolutionary movement are attracted by the prospect of sudden and spectacular change in their conditions of life. A revolutionary movement is a conspicuous instrument of change. Not so obvious is the fact that religious and nationalist movements too can be vehicles of change. 
some kind of widespread enthusiasm or excitement was apparently needed for the realization of vast and rapid change. And it does not seem to matter whether the exhilaration is derived from an expectation of untold riches or is generated by an active mass movement. In this country, remember this is written in 1951. In this country, the spectacular changes since the Civil War were enacted in an atmosphere charged with the enthusiasm born of fabulous opportunities for self-advancement. Where self-advancement cannot, this is important, or is not allowed to serve as a driving force, other sources of enthusiasm have to be found if momentous changes such as the awakening and renovation of a stagnant society or radical reforms in the character and pattern of life of a community are to be realized and perpetuated. Religious, revolutionary, and nationalist movements are such generating plants of general enthusiasm. So, I pose to you, Peter, does that sound like the situation we have now, or at least how people perceive it in terms of the United States? From my perspective, that would be a yes. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, and this is something that's important too. Um, it doesn't fundamentally matter whether or not there are ample opportunities in the United States for a mass movement to arise. What matters is whether people perceive them there them to be there or not and um because the people who perceive them to be there they're not going to join the mass movement but if a lot of people don't perceive that opportunity for whatever reason um, maybe because facebook keeps telling them the opportunity doesn't exist or they look in their communities and they've been wrecked by you know globalism or whatever then you have that perception and i think you have that perception both within you know what i would call for the purposes of this talk the social justice tribe, right? The people who claim that there is no American dream and there's no pro opportunity for advancement is a very common thing within those, those communities, but also within the MAGA tribe, because a lot of them come out of Appalachia and areas that have been decimated by the opioid crisis and who have, you know, measurably falling lifespans. So those areas are ripe from that element of the bug, right? Does that make sense? Um, let's read another one. Uh, all right, this one's a little bit long and complicated, but I think it's a good one. There is in us a tendency to locate the shaping forces of our existence outside ourselves. Success and failure are unavoidably related in our minds with the state of things around us. Hence, it is that people with a sense of fulfillment think it is a good world and would like to conserve it as it is, while the frustrated favor radical change. The tendency to look for all causes outside ourselves persists even when it is clear that our state of being is a product of personal qualities, such as our ability, our character, our appearance, our health, and so on. If anything ail a man, says Thoreau, so that he does not perform his functions, if he have a pain in his bowels even, he forthwith sets about reforming the world. Right, so this is a um, this is a passage that talks about the people who join mass movements, externalize their own failures, really, right? And um, if you're going to live in a meritocratic society or a society that represents itself as a meritocratic, and then you don't have merit, and then you see other people succeeding, then you don't want to blame yourself; you want to blame society. And then Facebook exacerbates this, right? Social media exacerbates this because what it does when you open up Facebook, you're seeing a feed and the feed is of people you know or people you're connected to and they don't post when they spill their coffee on their lap, right? They post the awesome, super cool thing they did. And so you're surrounded by a constant signal of everyone's life is better than yours, right? And so that it, it, it reinforces that perspective, whether it's true or not. Do you have any thoughts on that, Peter? Yeah, I think they call it <clears throat> the envy spiral uh, in, in the social media when you see someone's life is, is, is freaking amazing. Um, so yeah, that, that, that thing, I like that part when I was reading in your, your article about when you externalize the cause of someone's life successes. Um, you know, people, I think you were, the way you worded it is allyship to the status quo if you're well off. And then, uh, you know, revolution if you're not well off. Right. And, then, and then 
you know, how, how there's this, there's this felt sense that there's like this polarization, which I think is accurate. And you can kind of map it mimetically in different categories. But, you know, I think that's fair to say that there's a social justice constellation and then there's this uh, mega or reactionary constellation. Um, but there's people well off in both of those that are, are gesturing towards revolution. Right. Um, no. Yeah. That's actually covered a little bit later. It's um, uh, the, the general gist is, um, is covered later in the book. Um, the general gist is that um, if you are, if you're externalizing your failures, you're also sometimes externalizing your successes. And so people who are successful generally are very uh, sensitive to changing the um, rules of the game because they think that they might not have earned what they had. And then that might be a, a sort of a root contributor to conservative mindsets. Right. Um, but, uh, but there's a, a flip side to that too, because um, if you fall into this like uh, worship of the future or whatnot. You want to, you know, you want to be able to lock yourself into to this this wave. It's, it's covered a little bit, a little bit later. We can get down to that when we get there. But um, the one thing that's important to remember about again, just looking at MAGA and social justice, is that while MAGA we, is characterized as a conservative movement, it is still seeking radical change, right? Because what it's seeking is a departure from what it identifies we have now as not being the thing that it wants, right? It wants to drain the swamp. It wants to stop this. It identifies a bunch of failures within the current system and it wants to overturn it. And so both the social justice and the MAGA tribe are both doing the same. Their ultimate goal is to burn things down and fix it. Whether that is burn it down or it's drain the swamp, it's the same mindset, right? Could you, because um, I haven't, to be honest, following the news that closely as I once was, especially the culture war noise. Um, when you refer to Mega now, is it like, what is that? Like Fox News? Like what's the contours of it? Is it QAnon? Like what's in, in that kind of constellation? In, 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 my, in my perspective of that constellation is people who wear Mega hats, right? It's, it's that group. It's a, um, a group that, in my perspective, from what I've seen, tends to excuse Trump whenever he says something weird or presumes that he's said something, you know, it's the people who thought that Kafefe was not a typo. Right. And so that's, and then to be clear about sort of the social justice boundaries is you have some people, I can't remember whether we discussed this live yet, but um, you have some people who are interested in a more just society. I think almost everybody falls into that bucket in one way or another, but then you have inside that, Venn diagram. You have a subgroup of people who are the ones who push intersectionality doctrine and the ones who are, you know, um, waving the signs, right? And it, which we're running, you know, you talk about not being caught up in current events. I'm not following world event, you know, nation events as closely as I could be, right? I'm following Atlanta events very closely. So you've got a lot of crazy stuff going on with the protests here in Atlanta. And one of the things, this is kind of a step aside from the topic, but it's interesting to note, um, the Black Lives Matter community in Atlanta is deep and strong because we have a, we have a large African-American population here, and it is not just a poor African-American population. We have professionals at every level, and so the, the wealth is spread up. Now, I don't know that it's necessarily evenly represented, but it is up there, and it is a lot, and you, could not, you cannot interact in business in the United in, Atlanta, if you're racist, you wouldn't be able to get out of a board meeting, you know, because black folks are everywhere. So when the stuff turned violent in Atlanta, the Black Lives Matter people were like, whoa, like this is not what we want. You know, we own these buildings too, right? And so there is a rift forming inside Black Lives Matter right now in Atlanta between them and the, the Antifa contingent, the violent contingent, the Marxists and stuff. And I don't know how, I know it's formed. I know that, for instance, some Black Lives Matter organizers are trying to get the, the troublemakers on film, and then they're turning that information over to the police at an anti-police protest. So that's interesting. But um, I don't know how far that'll go, and it'll be an interesting thing to watch as it moves forward. But so, yeah, to, to your point, it's like the, the boundaries on these things are a little bit rough, and they're, gonna, they're not going to be as clear as they need to be on either side. But in my mind... Person wearing MAGA hat, one tribe, you know. Uh, person carrying intersectionality sign, other tribe. That's the, that's the characterizations here. 
Um, so let's move on. Let's see here. Oh, this is an important one. Those who are awed by their surroundings do not think of change no matter how miserable their condition. When our mode of life is so precarious as to make it patent that we cannot control the circumstances of our existence, we tend to stick to the proven the familiar. We counteract a deep feeling of insecurity by making of our existence a fixed routine. We hereby acquire the illusion that we have tamed the unpredictable. Fisher folk, nomads, and farmers who have have to contend with the willful elements, the creative worker who depends on inspiration, the savage awed by his surroundings. They all fear change. They face the world as they would an all-powerful jury. They abjectly poor too stand in awe of the world around them and are not hospitable to change. It is dangerous life when we hunger and cold and are, when hunger and cold are at our heels. There is thus a conservatism in of the destitute as profound as the conservatism of the privileged. And the former is as much a factor in the in the perpetuation of a social order as the latter. So what this passage is saying, and this crops up several other times in the book, I may have referenced another one in my notes later. The destitute poor, you know, the wretched poor are not the ones who form these movements. It's the comfortable bored poor right? It's the poor who have time to sit around and uh, bemoan their status, but they're not so preoccupied with how they're going to get food tomorrow, right? And so you, um, you know, when I read this passage to somebody who's a conservative, they might point at, you know, the, uh, the archetype of the blue-haired basement dwelling, nose hair, nose wheel, nose ring, sorry, having, you know, a social justice warrior. And they say, there he is. That's it. The comfortable board poor. And if I pre present this to a liberal, they're going to say, oh, look at those guys in the trailer parks with the MAGA hats on that are collecting disability and um, eating Cheetos and watching Fox News. And they're angry at the system. Right. So both of these are groups or pools that we have in the United States that um, are ripe for the kinds of psychologies that would join the mass movement. Right. Does that make sense? And then they have um, a slogan or a mission to rally behind, like make America great again, or the future right. is intersectional. Right. Make America great again and futures intersectional are both perfect slogans and they crop up in another note, actually, that's further down. I hope we have time to get there. Um, but uh, because it's, you know, Hoffer almost references that stuff almost explicitly. Um, so uh, let's keep moving. Let's see if we can get there. Oh yeah, it's the next note. Offhand, one would expect that the mere possession of power would automatically result in a cocky attitude toward the world and a receptivity to change. It is not always so. The powerful can be as timid as the weak. What seems to count more than possession of instruments of power is faith in the future. Where power is not joined with faith in the future, it is used mainly to ward off the new and preserve the status quo. On the other hand, extravagant hope, even when not backed by actual power, is likely to generate a mo most reckless daring. For the hopeful can draw strength from the most ridiculous sources of power, a slogan, a word, a button. So there you go, Peter. No faith is potent unless it is also faith in the future, unless it has a millennial component. So too, an effective doctrine, as well as being a source of power, it must also claim to be a key to the book of the future. So that is what the future's intersectional is. It's what make America great again is. It is the um, vision that drives the things, right? Today is bad. The future will be better as long as we go form up into this group, right? Let's do a next one since we were already talking about slogans. Um, for men to plunge headlong into an undertaking of vast change, they must be intensely discontented, yet not destitute. This is what we were talking about a second ago with the comfortable board poor, right? And they must have the feeling that by the possession of some potent doctrine, infallible leader, or some new technique, they have access to a source of irresistible power. Okay. Um, there's more, but I'm going to cut that off there because I want to focus on that. So the social justice folks have the perception that they have a potent doctrine 
right? They've got the intersectionality theory and uh, critical theory and all these sorts of internested theories of the world that become a overall worldview that they adopt. They all believe that by adopting that worldview, they're going to make the world a better place. Like that's something that is absolutely baseline for all the people that I know that are in it. And then with the MAGA folks, you have the more traditional one, which is a cult of personality, right? You've got an infallible leader or you've got potent doctrine. And that's what these things are centered around, right? Does that make sense? Um, do you have any other thoughts to add on that one, Peter? What do you think? Uh, there's some questions coming up, but it might pivot a little bit. So I don't know if you want to bookmark that or if you want to feel Go for it. it. Yeah. Go for it. Pivoting is fun. So what's going to mind is um, uh, Robert uh, J. Lifton's book uh, on uh, thought reform and the psychology of totalism, where he studied communist China, and he came up with um, like an eight criteria for thought reform. And then the first one was milieu control, um, where it involves like the control of inf information, communication, um, you know, by the powers that be. And so one thing I'm curious is were your thoughts on the interplay between, you know, these mass movements that are forming and then people that are influencing it via these slogans? Well, I don't know whether I'm exactly answering your question or not, but I'll take a stab at it. One of the, um, the MAGA movement is a very by the book kind of mass movement. It is the similar kind of thing that we've seen before. And the, it's got the cult of personality that everybody trusts. It's got that kind of thing. It kind of makes it easier to pick it out. But the interesting thing about the social justice movement is there isn't one of those. There's not a figurehead. There's not a leader. And that the indoctrinations that come with it are not fixed either, right? Like if you've got a great, like a Pope or something like that, he's got a book of indoctrinations that's thousands of years old and it's not changing he might tinker with a couple of things depending on how he thinks ne things need to match up with the current state of affairs in the world. Um, but he's only tinkering by reinterpretation, right? The social justice folks are, they're catching their, uh, it's, it's really, it's, it's a morality system. They're catching their morality system on the feed. They're catching it from Facebook and from Twitter and from Tumblr and they're interacting with it and they get juice from contributing to it and it is itself evolving right and it has no leader and i've talked to some people about that like don't you guys need to get together in like a council of trent to try and figure out which of these beliefs are apocrypha and which ones are canon you know like just to kind of nail it down you and i i think peter have talked about this before and they're very resistant to that even when you kind of like drag them along to the conclusion that they should do this they're like nah we got that covered. I'd rather just have it all be crowdsourced. It's like, well, why? It's like, we don't want leaders. Why? Because leaders can be taken down. Like I had one tell me that explicitly a couple of days ago. And that makes it harder to nail down. It also makes it, I think, on the end, more robust. Um, and it also makes it a little bit insulated from attacks within itself, right? Because you could have somebody who is a major player in it. And if they get taken down by cancel culture, which is kind of an attack vector on everyone, including themselves, then the movement outlives the leader. Right. Does that make sense? Does that answer your question or not? Um, I don't know. I, I still would want to inquire more into how you see, um, or how Eric Hoffer would see sort of like media, uh, being involved with it or sort of uh, people manipulating this message uh, purposely in order to navigate these movements um, to serve their own purpose. Uh, Hoffer has a section towards the end of the book about uh, men of words. And that's really what he's talking about there. And it's a, um, the idea behind it being um, that movements the leader of leadership of the movement might be, you know, it might be a government figurehead or something like that. But behind that, you have a group that are men of words, people who are uh, 
intelligent and who are pushing the movements, indoctrinations and thoughts and whatnot forward and are respected and referenced, but don't necessarily step up onto the front lines to become, you know, the, you know, the president or something like that. I think that were Eric alive today and he were trying to write this book about what's going on now, he would have to add to that section. And I think what he would do is he would include the social media element and the crowdsourcing element as a new and different way to achieve the same objective as the men of words section in this book. It's one of the reasons I didn't put a whole lot of the stuff in from the men of words section into my notes, because I don't think it's as applicable as it was back then. I think back then you had to have men of words, the men of words were writing things and they were going into newspapers, right? Um, and then they were influencing where the movement goes. And I think what's going on now that everyone has an, can write a newspaper and shuttle it out to the entire rest of the planet. And we have a, you know, uh, a gatekeeping issue where there are none that the thing is become a lot more cross connected and a lot more crowdsourced than he could have ever imagined. Right. You know, he lived pre-internet. So that's my thoughts on that. I think, is that better? I answer your question. What do you think? Yeah. Uh, and another question <laughs> emerged, uh, <laughs> <Go> <laughs> this, um, and then there, we have a few questions, uh, um, in the chat box. And I think the person who, who challenged you on Twitter is here too. And they just asked a question. So do, do you want to, okay. after I ask my question, you want to pivot to the question sure. in the chat box? Sure. Great. We could do that. Or also we could, we could reserve some of them towards the end and just do a, you know, face to face Q and a, where we actually talk, you know, that kind of thing too. Um, you know, I, I don't know how you, I don't know how these things go. Yeah. Usually that I just ask people to go off mute and then they unmute themselves and ask their question. Okay. All right. Yeah. Well, we can pause now and we can do some of that if we want. Sure. Um, so yeah, let me talk to you. However you want to run it. Yeah. I think, uh, at the half hour mark, I think it'd be good to, to field some questions and if it, That's if good. it dies down, we can go back to the quotes. Um, yeah, so one of the, the person that challenged you on Twitter, they, they talked about the false equivalency and they had, the, it was a different right. reason that I'm going to bring up, but so the question I have to you is yeah, just speak personally from on, on behalf of myself, but Canada is much different here, obviously, but there, there is a huge social justice, uh, segment and we have like, a at least in Toronto, it's like the rebel media and they're, yeah, I think you were on rebel media, right? They, that's, uh, I... Ezra, Ezra. Oh yeah. 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 yeah you're on right. rebel. Yeah. Yeah. So that's like our Canadian yeah. version of like Fox news, I guess. Right. Um, yeah. 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 So, I was on there for a five minute bit. I was, I was very pleased that it was, it stayed culture war free predominantly. Yeah. yeah that's surprising. Um, um, yeah. Well, it's cause I looked over Ezra stuff and I was like, Ooh, I might be walking into something. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Very clean. yeah. And so I've talked to a few people who went to like, you know, we're in that the rebel media scene and it, it just feels like they're making the same conversational moves as social justice warriors. It's like, you know, I can't have a nuanced conversation. I can't kind of put us collectively at the edge of our thinking because they just barf out the propositions and we got to deal with that. Right. Um, so there's a lot of similarities there, uh, psychologically speaking. Um, but returning to uh, Clifton's idea of that kind of the thought control thing, he has, he has something, uh, one of the eight criteria is confession. You know, like people have to uh, confess their sins. And so mm -hmm. you can say about apologizing by your privilege or whatever. And then they have something, the dispensing of existence. That's, that's his final one. And that's essentially related to cancel culture. Um, does mega or this constellation of reactionary tribes, do they make the same moves as, you know, the social justice as a crowdsourced religion, which maps over to some of the stuff I just mentioned? Well, I think cancel culture is universal for stuff. I think that um, a lot of people are making the claim that it is a liberal only thing or a, you know, a, a social justice only thing. And uh, like one of the, the best examples, uh, counter examples, I think of that was in the news a couple of days ago, the Dixie chicks changed their name to the chicks, but you got to remember they already got canceled once they got canceled by the conservatives because they were against the Iraq war. I think, I think that was why. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. right. So um, that kind of thing has gone on all the time. And the, the only thing a lot of people don't understand about cancel culture is it, it is, it's something that erupts a lot and it goes all the way back at least to the original culture comp in Germany, right? Um, I guess in the late 1860s, I could be wrong about that. Um, I think it's, I, this could be, I, I have to check my math. I believe it's Pope Gregory the 16th had his first, um, 
encyclature against free speech was a laundry list of the same arguments that cancer culture makes now about deplatforming. It was, you, these are dangerous ideas, and why would we spread dangerous ideas? Who would, who would say, and, you know, the idea, well, it's a dangerous idea. You can always argue against it. You know, show why the dangerous idea is wrong. And the Pope is back in 1860 talking about, why would we spread around poison just because we have an antidote? Which is the argument that you hear, you know, um, the left-wing side of cancel culture make today. But you, I would bet you'd be able to dig up an example of the right-wing side saying the same thing in the 1980s, right? So I don't perceive that as a one tribe thing. I perceive it as a, um, a societal function that's been around at least 100, 150 years and maybe further back. Yeah. So do you think it's fair to say that those components of like the social justice uh, constellation is more salient uh, because they have more like pop cultural power, if you will? Um. I think that getting canceled by the left is uh, a bigger fear than getting canceled by the right right now for two reasons. One is that the people who do the canceling from a platform perspective are all out of Silicon Valley, which is left. And the other thing that makes people more scared about the left than the right is the fact that the societal indoctrinations, the morality set being wielded by the social justice people is constantly under revision and it's changing faster than a lot of people can keep up with. And so they think they're doing something right. And then suddenly they don't realize that they've crossed against whatever the new rules are because they didn't follow the feed closely enough to be able to find out that the rules changed and the velocity with which those with which the morality is being adjusted and modified and evolving on the left is something that's difficult for somebody who's not plugged into it to keep up with, right? Like you just don't know. Um, like, like this is not to be pejorative and I'm not like trying to trash anybody about this, but like, you know, how many genders are there in 2020? Like, I, th I think I'm not even positive, but I think it's like there's an infinite gender spectrum is the accepted thing in 2020, but that that's not what it was in 2016. There were 37 of them then. Right. And before there were 37 of them, there was some other number. And there's a lot of people who haven't even got on the beginning of that train yet. And so if they step out and say something like there's two genders, now they're a turf, you know, and they're subject to punch a turf and all this kind of thing. And they, they might've just missed the feed, you know, the update. It could even be somebody on the left who has just hasn't been paying attention to that particular uh, rolling adjusted piece of morality. Right. And so there's a lot of people that are afraid that they might get canceled just because they missed some instructions. You see what I'm saying? So those are the two thing reasons why I think everybody's more scared of getting canceled by the left and the right. Everybody pretty much knows what will get canceled, get you canceled by the right. Just like, you know, we, in the eighties, we, you don't say anything bad about Christians because everything, everybody's predominantly Christian, but you also know that, you know, you've got a pretty good idea what's in that book because the book hadn't changed in a while. Right. So that was not as big a fear back then. Does that make sense? That's my thoughts on, that's current thoughts on cancel culture, which is kind of a, you know, it's the, um, you know, it's the excommunication engine and the weapon to keep people in line. Right. right. And it, and I think and both sides do it, they both do it. So. So let's pivot to some questions. We got some good ones. Uh, Phil and on, you had a question. You want to meet yourself and ask it? Or do you want me to read on your behalf, Phil? There's no mic. There's no mic? Okay, so I'll read on his behalf. In the past, there were uncomfortable... They, in the past, there weren't uncomfortable poor, but there were mass movements. What changed? I think that if you go back and look at most of the mass movements, um, the... People may, looking at people making the mass movements were comfortable by their standard, right? Um, you know, they were they had enough food to where they're not hungry, or they had previously enough food and now they just became on just became hungry and they're angry about that. You know what I mean? Um, 
I suspect that that's probably a lot of it. And, um, but that's generally, that's a historical question that I'm not sure I'm qualified to answer. I think you'd probably have to ask Hoffer that, and it might be in Hoffer's response to that might be buried in the book. So I can't say that I can give a great answer to that question. Quite honestly, I'd rather not give a bad one than, than, uh, than not give one at all. Um, cool. Okay. Steph, you had a, a question. Would you like to unmute yourself? Hey there. Hey. Thank you for this. Um, I, I might have some distractions. I have my family going on behind me, so I apologize in advance. But sure. um, first, I confess this conversation makes me allergic, so I had to, um, I had to overcome that with that open mind and some space um, for the, um, for the potential of um, crossing over some of, some of these conversations and. And I've been thinking about it that if we could find some common ground, like you um, mentioned in that justice is a, you know, it's an overarching cause, that that's a good cause. And the way that people are expressing their um, work for it um, manifests differently. So some people hold signs and you mentioned them. that's you know, one way that you're identifying social justice warriors. So, so I've learned that backing up into like that shared value of justice, which the MAGA people might share as well, um, can be helpful. So, um, you know, my experience of this is embodied as a human rights activist in the 80s and 90s. So when the whole SJW thing came along, I was really confused by it. Um, and maybe it was just my generation. So I'm trying, I'm really trying to understand it. And so in the interest of shared values, I wonder if backing up into the construct of human rights as defined by, as a starting point, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights that um, was ratified in 1948. I wonder if that's a, a place to start. And I just want to thank you for having this conversation. Yeah. Um, well, first off, you know, it's like, I don't want to, I have said things so far and we'll probably end up saying some things further on that are, uh, you know, could maybe rightfully so be construed as pejorative against MAGA and against social justice. But the truth about the thing is that there's nothing inherently wrong with either of them. I have a deeply social justice nanny downstairs with my kids right now. And I've got friends that were over at the, you know, last over at my house last weekend talking about MAGA. And, um, and these are good people. And one of the things that I think that we need to keep in mind, and I have a problem with a lot of my friends, like, you know, being nasty to each other on Facebook and stuff like this, is that almost all people are good people, no matter what movement they're in. And that extends, you know, I hate to say it, I definitely hate to say it, and something's put on Facebook, that extends the Nazis, right? Most of the Germans are good people, right? And so we don't need to characterize anybody who's in any of these things as bad because they're in one of them. That's the first thing we've got to do, right? You know, just because someone's social justice or something, or just because somebody's MAGA, that doesn't mean they're bad, okay? They're tied up in a movement. And it doesn't necessarily mean that the goals of the movement are bad either. The thing that worries me is that once these movements get kicking, they don't, you don't really know where they're going to end up, right? Like, you know, I, Hitler, I don't think, I'm not a great Hitler historian, but I'm pretty sure he didn't open his like democratic platform with let's gas the Jews. I don't think that was on his plan, right? I think it showed up later. And by that time, everybody was all sucked into it and it seemed like the right thing to do, right? Um, and I fear that either of these things saying MAGA or social justice because of the nature of how mass movements work could end up in a place like that. Right. And so I worry about that. And, um, the, it, my, and it's weird cause it's like, um, I think trying to bring an analysis framework, like the social justice half of it is both better and worse on that angle than MAGA is because, um, the, the idea of human rights really heavily pervades the social justice folks. Like they are really focused on that. 
and that to their credit, right? But the fact that the thing is constantly being updated and is constantly evolving in directions that none of them could have predicted five years ago means there's no telling where it ends up and it, and it's evolving quickly. Right. Um, and if you don't keep up with it, you get excommunicated from within, you know, um, you showed up with, you know, certain like, you know, like what's happening with, um, really like, I think the turf wars right now with the trans exclusionary radical feminist break is going to, is a great example of that where you have, you know, class feminists who are feminist activists been around for 20 years going, wait, what the hell, when did this happen? And then now they're being excommunicated. They don't like it, you know? So, um, there's no way to tell where this, that thing's going to go. And so that's a little bit scarier, but who knows, right? Who knows? Um, the, you talked about having a shared system going back to, okay, so we all do believe in justice. Maybe we can work out from there, right? I think that's a smart idea, and that's probably the best way to begin communications. Um, the thing that is tough is there's a language barrier inside both of these mass movements where you say one thing and they interpret what you said as something else. Um, you know, a lot of that flows from critical theory and postmodernism and all of that, that bubble. But, you know, you have the same thing going on in different ways in, in MAGA. I just, I can't think of one off the top of my head, but I know I've noticed it before. And um, so it can be difficult. You start from a, a shared space and work your way out. The other thing that's um, a little bit frustrating is that both of them have incorporated um, chauvinism as a tool and or you know uh prejudice as a tool and that really drives me crazy it really drives me up the wall that you see that going on in both of them and you know i the you know the examples of, of it within maga are like blatantly obvious and i don't even think they need to be restated you know it's like they they, they don't like mexicans right you know um but then the flip side you know is social justice is they don't like straight white males and I'm not, as a straight white male, I'm not that offended. I'm not that worried. I'm fine. I'm not, I'm safe from them most likely, but uh, there's, you know, stuff going on on the ground right now they're, where they're trying to push the thing forward in that direction uh, pretty quickly. You know, I don't know. I think it was just this past week they they put a um, initiative on the California ballot to get rid of the anti-discrimination uh, section of their constitution so that they're allowed to discriminate because they decided that affirmative action didn't do it quickly enough. And I'm like, whoa, well, that, I know what that means. Um, that's bold. So the fact that discrimination is being used as a tool on both of these movements is very alarming to me because that's a, that's a tool that wasn't supposed to be on the table anymore. We were supposed to have removed that, you know, and that, that really frustrates me. I think that there's no good that's going to come from that. I think things are going to get worse because of that. Do you have any follow-up thoughts or comments, Steph? Um, just that I know following these things on Twitter, like the turf wars you describe, um, is very different than being on the ground and talking to people and organizing them. And you, it sounds like you do talk to people, so I'm not saying you don't. Um, but like in my experience, which is current um, with the movement you describe, I don't hate white man, I'm married to one and I, I love him very much and his ilk, I mean, it's very easy to take, and I'm sure it happens with MAGA too, to take um, perhaps somebody like the worst example and, and generalize it. And um, the kind of division you describe, I don't, I don't know, it's a very, you know, what I, in my rural area, the really pretty decentralized, you know, it's just like, you know, there, it's a lot of white men involved in it. It's, um, there's not the kind of infighting that you're describing that certainly is highlighted on social media. It just might be different in the embodied experience than what you're, what you're seeing um, 
you know, through a lens and we all have our own lens and I'm certainly biased towards um, what people describe as social justice, um, warriorism. Um, but I'm really coming from a foundation of human rights and I do believe it's, you know, my duty as a human being to note when somebody's being harmed and to act if I have any agency in that. And I am concerned that um, people who have that very human and compassionate impulse might, might, might actually um, not um, note when they see harm for fear of being told that they're virtue signaling or they're an SJW. So they, they and, and that, that in the same way that you are chilled by um, what, you know, by not knowing where these movements could go and seeing that they could equally um, be fascist in some way. I'm chilled by um, what I fear could be the dampening of the human spirit to notice harm and to act to prevent it. So um, that's kind of where I'm coming from. But I, I really do appreciate this. That's, I, I, I want to keep talking, actually. Um, so so that's, uh, that's an interesting point, And that's something I had not ever considered. So um, you you would perceive that uh, some people might not speak up because they're afraid of being accused of being an SJW. Whereas, oh, yeah, I have. Really? Been. Yeah, really? I mean, I don't want to wow. deal with the fallout of, you know, I, I don't want to huh. be defined by that. I have a lot of things that don't fall into that category. So I, I'm concerned that um, I won't be heard completely if I'm just dumped into that category. So, but I have to own my roots. Like I have to own my values, which right. are human rights. And right now in the world, that's how they're being expressed. So yeah, so yeah, that's the real thing. And I must say like uh, for women as well, like um, just like anything on social media, um, it doesn't, you know, it can be really uncomfortable. I don't mean to make it about gender, um, but that's just my lived embodied experience. So yeah, but thank you for listening. If, if that was not something that um, had, had, um, had been noticed or, or said to you before no yeah that's that's good i like that it's uh that's something i'll try and look out more for because it's um it's not the kind of things even talking with folks that who are kind of like rooted into the social justice stuff um uh that's not something that's not a comment that i'd heard before and it could be that this just happens to be regional you know like depending on where you're at what the the relative weights of the different uh factions are wherever you happen to be you know is that could be part of it. Well, um, I've, I've lived in New York City and Boston, and so and now I live in a rural place. So um, it definitely feels like a straw man argument. Like somebody is not listening to whatever you're trying to say because they've already, they're going to shoot down the straw man of SJW, which I find like kind of, um, you know, it's just how tw I think that's a nature of Twitter. Like, I just think these conversations are almost impossible to have on Twitter. So I appreciate Oh, no, no, no. You can't, you can't have a conversation on Twitter. Yeah. You can't, and you can't have that at all. Right. A lot of yeah. our assumptions are, are built there and then confirmed. Yeah. I mean, my, the, I don't, I don't draw any assumptions from anything on Twitter. I try not to. I just look at kind of like occasionally I'll see what's getting a lot of traffic and whatnot and, and I'll see references to another media. But like my concern with when I talk about prejudice is not about, um, it's about like, for instance, the new Reddit terms of service that came out last week. Uh, they changed their hate speech policy so that hate speech is uh, prohibited except against majority groups. And that explicitly means white men. So they have a carve out say that hate speech against white men is fine, according to the policy, but it's not against towards anybody else. And during uh, uh, Gay Pride Month, Facebook had the same thing, where they had an adjustment to their hate speech policy so that anybody who was called out for hate speech against white men, as long as it was in support of gay rights, that was fine. That was given a pass for the month, those sorts of things. And you know, these are things that are you know, big technology companies are doing that impact the way people talk and the way people think. And so that's got to come from somewhere. So those are the kinds of things when I, so when I, I take the test temperature of it, that's kind of where I'm getting my temperature gauge from. It's not from just looking at, at, you know, 
people throwing garbage at each other on Twitter because there's so many people on Twitter that just throw garbage and why would you pay attention to them? You know, I don't, I don't, I hardly do any of it. The only reason I do any of that stuff is to talk to the people who read my articles basically and to Peter, you know, that's it. Um, so anyway, um, let's, this has been good. And I, I wouldn't mind talking to you offline too, if you want to reach out and we can, we can connect. Let's try and get back to the, the Hoffer stuff though, because that's why everybody showed up. Thank you. Uh, do you, do you want to, there's an, uh, a few other questions. Uh, oh, more wanna... questions. That's fine. Let's do questions and let's, let's do more Hoffer. So uh, Ben, who left, uh, he said, uh, okay, no, that's, that's his leaving comment. Okay. Uh, da, 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 da. Yeah. How do you think we can pull off the moderates on both sides into a collaborative conversations? And is that a useful strategy for mitigating violent feedback loops or perhaps let this thing play out? Mm, Hoffer says moderates don't matter. According to his book, his belief is that um, uh, stuff is done that uh, the, move, the movers are done by the extremes. Um, let me see, uh, let me see if I can find that, that quote actually. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's just pivot to Hoffer to answer his question. So, um, the intro to part two, the potential converts opens like this. The game of history is usually played by the best and worst over the heads of the majority in the middle. The reason that the inferior elements of a nation can exert a marked influence on its course is that they are wholly without reverence towards the present. They see their lives and the present as spoiled beyond remedy, and they see and they are ready to waste and wreck both, hence their recklessness and their will to chaos and anarchy. They also crave to dissolve their spoiled, meaningless selves in some soul-stirring, spectacular communal undertaking, hence their proclivity for united action. Thus, they are among the early recruits of revolutions, mass migrations, and of religious, racial, and chauvinist movements and they imprint their mark upon these upheavals and movements with a sh which shape a nation's character and history. That was Hoffer's take on that question. Hoffer's take was the people in the middle are just cooking along and the people at the top move the, the nation and the people at the bottom move the nation. The people at the top move it by making decisions and the people at the bottom move it by wrecking them, right? And this is a... um. Like, okay, so here's a, here's a personal anecdote. Um, when the folks in, in Minneapolis burned a police station down, um, I was impressed. And the next morning, I turned on Sublime, and, um, and I cranked up that song. It's April 24th, 1992, right, about the Rodney King riots. I was like, wow, you know, they did it. Um, and there is something to be said for, you know, a, a very uh, uh, cynical view of our political system might be that A, voting doesn't matter because it always never did. And the people who are, you're allowed to vote for are handpicked by some kind of, you know, like small group, right? But that an, an oligarchy, and there's actually good statistics on the fact that we're in an oligarchy in the United States, not early democracy. Um, but that the thing that controls the oligarchy into pushing them towards policy that is meaningful to the people on the bottom is the fear of revolt, right? And that if they ever get too out of line, you know, you burn stuff until they see the error of their ways and then maybe they'll self-correct, right? Um, and that kind of thinking is kind of built, built into, you know, built into Hoffer's answer to that. And it's not the people in the middle that are, you know, going punching the clock in their day job that, that do it. These people just kind of come along for the ride, according to Hoffer. Um, so the answer kind of is, no, if you're in the middle, sit tight, right? Um, there's another quote that's later on. So let me find that one. That's good. And that was your advice on the paper. Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to find that one because was, cause that was based off of, uh, here we go. All right. Um, we'll read this one. When people are ripe for a mass movement, they're usually ripe for any effective movement and not solely for one with a particular doctrine or program. In pre-Hitlerian Germany, it was often a toss-up whether a restless youth would join the communists or the Nazis. In the overcrowded pale of czarist Russia, the simmering Jewish population was ripe both for revolution and Zionism. In the same family, one member would join the revolutionaries and the other the Zionists. 
Dr. Chaim Weissman quotes a saying of his mother in those days, quote, whatever happens, I shall be well off. If Shemuel, the revolutionary son, is right, we shall all be happy in Russia. And if Chaim, the Zionist, is right, then I shall go live in Palestine. So Chaim was right. They moved to Palestine, to Israel, and then Dr. Chaim Weissman became the first president of Israel. Okay. And they had, but they had their eyes on the ground and they had knew when to get the heck out of Dodge, right? Like if things are going to go bad, the people in the middle need to just you know, look, monitor their surroundings, make sure they know what's going on, get the hell out is my thinking. Um, if things get that bad, I don't know that there's much that you can, once a mass movement really gets going, you know, who wants to stand in front of a freight train, but that's, I will admit that my view on that is deeply cynical and possibly not right. Um, I just think it might be right for me. Um, for my family and our circumstances, but I don't know. You know, so that's, that would be something that might be a couple of good Hoffer answers to that question. It's a good question. So, so double click on that. Um, we are at the hour mark, so we're going to close up soon. But to double click on your advice to other people, just kind of hold tight, right? And then I think he's like, get your prepper game on. Yeah, um, sure. So, so can you speak a little bit more about that and then how are you personally responding to this? Um, well, okay, so... I, all right. Well, it's person, you know, personal history. Um, my wife was diagnosed with cancer in 2017. She passed away in 2019. I only started writing to try and get some of the insomnia out of my head. And, you know, really, I think largely as a, um, as an antidote for the general chaos in my life. And when I was writing, I initially started writing about gun policy and gun statistics and the biggest article I've ever had was which put up on the front page of medium and blasted out by them and everything was the one I went on Ezra Klein show about, which is the surprisingly solid mathematical case with the tinfoil hat gun prepper, right? In, you, in any given lifetime in the United States, you've got a, about a 33% chance of living through a violent revolution, statistically speaking. And that's just on a historical frequency analysis and doesn't take into account anything that's going on around us. When uh, risk analysis professionals do that kind of math, in 2018, they were saying more like a 30% chance in the next 10 years. And then if you bring in some of the research by Turchin, you know, secular cycles and things like that, the, um, the cycle is due for that kind of thing sometime very soon. So I think that preparing yourself to be immersed in Nationwide violence is a very smart thing to do right now. It doesn't set you back that much to have a plan. And it's just disaster planning. It's like anything else. You live on the coast, you have a hurricane plan. If you live in the United States, you need to have a, you know, revolution plan for your family. Um, you know, whether or not that plan involves guns is going to have to be a personal decision. If it does, then you need to go ahead and bow up and spend the time to learn how to use them properly. And you also don't need to have them in your house if you're suicidal, that kind of thing. But you know, I'm a generally a pro gun person. So you know, like I would not discourage anyone from going that route, but you also got to have food and medicine and um, some place to go is nice, you know, if things get gnarly. And then the other thing you can do is you can look back at, you know, um, what happened, who are the successful people and the unsuccessful people in areas where this kind of thing erupted before, right? Um, there's a really good blog on a guy who uh, lived in Bosnia during the Bosnian war and what kind of prepper stuff he did before it happened and then what he did to survive while it happened. And the biggest lesson that he had was you need a team, you need a group, you need to know your neighbors, you need people you can rely on. Um, and then uh, – that sort of thing. So, you know, that kind of research to see kind of what people have done. And then the other thing is, you know, having uh, international mobility is also really useful. A lot of people end up moving right before these things. The smart ones get out of Dodge. You know, um, I'm not in a 
position yet where I can move to the coast and buy another sailboat, but I will be soon. And when my kids are old enough to crew it, that's definitely happening. Right. You know, I'm talking to some of my, my friends from America and they felt like you guys can't leave or for, for the most part, you can't fly out. And then there's this feeling of stuckness there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, COVID didn't help, right? <laughs> COVID really puts the, puts a, a crank on this thing, you know, and Hoffer talks about how unemployment uh, drives these things up. And so when the unemployment spike from COVID hit, it was just exacerbated everything. And also golly, you know, it's like, if you've got, at an ordinary uh, protest, whether it's for a conservative or a liberal cause, um, if somebody decides to act violently, most people are just going to look at them like they're stupid, right? But if everybody's wearing a mask, there might be a few more people like, you know, yeah, I might throw a brick too. I'm already wearing a mask. This is one of the reasons we don't have, we have laws against masks, right? That we're ignoring right now. So, um, you know, so the COVID has really kind of just amped this thing up. It's like throwing gasoline on the fire, I think, as if we didn't have enough fire going into the election this year. Right. So any, uh, closing thoughts for us or anything we, you think we should, uh, you know, read up on or anything you'd like to leave us with? Well, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my, um, my, the notes that I did from the second half of the book that I cooked up for this thing. And I'll probably whip those into another article. That's a companion article to the first one, because it gets, uh, it's also very detailed and very relevant and it's surprising how relevant a lot of this stuff is. And so if, you know, anybody here is interested in the discussion then they can probably pick up that one. If they had, haven't already read the first one, they read that one too. And, um, or, I mean, gracious, buy this book. It's not a big book. It's a pretty short book. Like in paperback, it's like yay big and that thick. You know, it's it's something that you can cruise through in, you know, a day if you're at the beach. Um, but it's it's kind of alarming. The whole thing is just so full of stuff. It's hard to not, it's hard not to just highlight the whole thing when you're trying right. to take notes with it. Right, it's, right. Um, and it's very good. Very cool. All right, man. So, um a few other people I noticed have uh, some questions in the chat, but I have to at least I'll close this up and then you can stay here if you want, if you want to chat further. Um, we'll, we'll steal some questions or I can just email them to you. So that being said, love to have you back on my friend, uh, maybe for round two of this uh, upcoming events at the STOA. We've got the Socratic speed dating tonight, 7 PM Eastern time. And then we have um, Pat Ryan's dark STOA on dismantling humanism. I think, I think you might like that series, uh, VJ, and that's at uh, 8.30 mm. p.m. Eastern time. Um, yeah, and then just check out the website. The store is based off the gift economy, inspired to provide a gift. Just go to the store.ca slash gift. All right. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming up today. See you. Thanks, Peter. I appreciate it. Yeah, man. Take care.